everyone and welcome to our webinar on Clean Captive Power Insights on the Commercial and Industrial Solar PV Market in Kenya. This webinar is hosted by UNFDTU Partnership, which is, which is a collaborating center between UN Environment Program and the Technical University of Denmark. We provide leading international research and advisory on the topics of energy, climate and sustainable development. My name is Louise and I'm a project assistant for the Temerin project at the UNEP DTU partnership. Um, before we move on to the main content, I would like to let you know that this webinar will last around one hour and 15 minutes and will include time for a Q&A session. You will be muted throughout the whole webinar. However, you are more than welcome to write your questions in the chat box to the right. Please indicate the name of the speaker your question is directed to, and we will then answer your questions during the Q&A session. If you are unable to stay until the end of the webinar, or if you want to access our presentations, all the materials and the recording of the whole webinar will be available online on UNEP DTU Partnerships website. You'll find the link to the website and to the project report on the last slide of the webinar presentation. So before we start, I would like to inform you that we comply with the General Data Protection Act, also known as the GDPR. This means that your personal data, such as name, email, workplace, etc., is safely processed and stored, and all of your rights in relation to the GDPR are respected. This also means that you have full access to the data being processed about you, and at any time you can request that inaccurate data can be deleted or uh, rectified. For access or further information, please contact Alice and Louise, whose uh, contact details are indicated in the slide. So today we are joined by five speakers. Our first speaker is Lakshmi Bamidipati, who is a research fellow from UNEP DTU Partnership. She will highlight the key findings from the UNEP DTU Partnership's report on commercial and industrial solar PV market in Kenya. She will provide an overview of the market growth and the main drivers and barriers and demand and supply aspects in the Kenyan solar PV market. Our second speaker is Hin Ilrisi, who is an Associate Program Officer from UNEP in Nairobi. She will share her insights on the financial models and mechanisms of the captive solar PV CNI market in Kenya, including the existing barriers and some lessons for some other countries. Then um, we have Nixon Bukaki, who is a senior renewable specialist from the Energy and Petroleum Regulatory Authority in Kenya. Nixon will share his insights on the policy and regulatory aspects of this captive PV market, clarifying specific regulations with regards to leasing purchase and power agreements for CNI consumers, the licensing process and the experiences so far. Then um, we will move on to look at the demand supply dynamics of the solar PV market in Kenya. Here on the demand side, we have Sylvester Nakata, who is a senior energy advisor from the Kenya Association of Manufacturers. He will share his insights on the demand side uptake of captive PV by the industrial sector. This will include electricity cost incentives and savings, experiences of the industrial consumers, as well as lessons for um, other countries. And finally, um, Jeffrey Rono, co-founder and director of the solar company Optin, will share some experiences from a local Kenyan solar company that is servicing CNI consumers in the regional market in East Africa and what challenges solar PV companies um, are experiencing. And um, at the end, we will have a Q&A session where our speakers will answer the questions that you, that you might have. And uh, lastly, I would like to let you know that we will have comprehensive biographies of all the speakers available in the slides for download um, after the webinar. And um, now I would like to um, give, the, give the floor to our first speaker, Lakshmi Pamidipati. Thank you, Louisa. 
Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining our webinar. My name is Lakshmi, and I'm a research fellow at UNFD2 Partnership based in Copenhagen. And today I'll be sharing some highlights from our recently published report on clean captive power. For those of you who may not be aware, we've just released a detailed report on this topic, and you will find a link to this at the end of my presentation. I'll start with a brief introduction to our organization and the project. UNFDTU partnership is a collaboration between UN Environment uh, Program and Technical University Denmark, and it's a leading international research uh, institute focusing on energy, climate, and sustainable development. Um, this captive PV work is part of a project called Temerin, which is Technology, Markets, and Investment for Low Carbon and Climate Resilient Development. It's a three-year Danida funded project, and its country focus is Kenya, Uganda. It has three main objectives. First is to analyze successful uh, cases on market-led interventions of climate technologies in Kenya. Second is to support technology transfer partnerships in climate mitigation and te adaptation technologies in Uganda, and also to understand how domestic solar PV SMEs can increase their share in the global value chains and support them in co-creating uh, outcomes in Kenya and Uganda. This uh, CNI PV is part of the first component. It's a case study that we looked into in depth and uh, to identify some of the lessons and learnings. Please do check our website for future updates on the project. I have included a link to that as well at the end of my presentation. Moving on, I think you all might already be aware of the context, the industrial and commercial businesses which are highly energy intensive have, have been witnessing reduced productivity and direct losses due to unreliable and expensive electricity. Added to this is the reliance over diesel generators, which are expensive and also lead to emissions. Self-generation by these businesses through solar PV has become a viable alternative. Um, some of these substituting 20 to 25 percent uh, of their electricity consumption. So what is clean captive PV? This is understood uh, by different terminologies and definitions from self-generation to embedded generation, uh, rooftop, carport uh, solutions vis-a-vis -vis ground mount solution, also CNI, which is a short form of commercial and industrial PV systems. There are three types of these systems. Uh, uh, one is the simple grid tied consumers who supplement their daytime consumption uh, through solar PV. Second are those consumers with unreliable grid access, which, which then source power from multiple sources, including diesel, solar. And third is a completely off grid client that includes, that relies on solar as well as battery storage for a continuous electricity access. And from our study, we witnessed that the first category is the most dominant one currently in Kenya. A previous Bloomberg finance report in 2019 identified that the increasing potential of CNI PV systems in sub-Saharan Africa, and Kenya is one of the highest, has one of the highest installed capacities. Subsequently, UNEP D2 conducted a series of in-person interviews as well as Skype calls with private sector firms, financiers, regulatory authority, uh, and we also reviewed a lot of secondary information to compile this report uh, and to uncover various developments in this particular market segment. We find that, uh, as you can see also from the graph, we find that a total of nearly 40 megawatt capacity installations have um, are in place, of which 30 megawatt is already installed and nearly 10 megawatt is under construction as of December 2019. But already as I speak, I received some additional information after the report was published, which actually makes takes the number to 45 megawatt uh, and at least a 10 megawatt in pipeline. So it's a highly dynamic market at the moment uh, and the numbers are changing constantly. So where is this demand coming from? Uh, according to KPLC, there are 3,900 large CNI consumers, and we try to disaggregate the data for 184 projects, captive PV projects. We first try to split it into multiple categories that we could come up with. And as you can see on the graph, the dominant category is the manufacturing industry, manufacturing units, almost 14,000 kilowatt, followed by flower farms, universities, commercial complexes, tea and coffee plantations, shopping malls, and tourist lodges. 
Um, we further tried to consolidate these categories and came up with four broad categories. It's industrial, commercial, horticultural, institutional, which stand out as those mega meta sectors. And we also define them further in terms of which of the disaggregated categories fall into these sectors. And if you can see industrial category overall leads uh, as a consumer for CNI system at 36% of these projects installed followed very closely by the commercial projects, uh, then by horticulture and institutional. We haven't included the residential rooftop category because of uh, lack of data, but that would be, that's also a growing segment and is very interesting to look into. We further try to disaggregate and break up the projects and we find that nearly 72% of the projects fall below 200 kilowatt peak capacity. So actually majority of the projects installed have a capacity below 200 kilowatt and 26%, per, 14% are in the category of 200 to 500 kilowatt, uh, whereas only 15% of the projects are above 500 kilowatt. Towards the supply side, we see that the key actors include the EPC and ONM firms that perform a range of activities from project development, designing, procurement, installation to maintenance of the systems. Uh, a range of uh, international financiers, development finance institutions, public and private have also been supporting the sector through debt and equity uh, components followed by ESCOs, which are energy service companies that build on and operate energy systems, either by selling a service, that is through signing a power purchase agreement with the consumer, or by leasing the system, either through an operating lease uh, or a rent to own lease where the customer can own the system once the leasing period is complete. As you can see in the table, we have mapped the various financiers private sector firms, as well as some of the subcontractors uh, who are active in this market. Uh, some of them have been in, around in the solar PV market overall for a long time, but also there are a few newer entrants in this segment, and a few firms have also already exited the market. What we also find on the business and uh, implementation model side is that there are three main uh, models. First is direct outright purchase by consumers who own and operate the system themselves and secure finance. Second is uh, where the consumer buys power from an ESCO for an agreed price by signing a PPA for a 2025 year period. And in this case, the ESCO is the legal entity of the system and the con contractual conditions and the prices are agreed upon between the consumer and the ESCO. Third is that the consumer leases a system, so and it pays a fee towards the uh, equipment that's leased, either through, as I mentioned previously, operating or a rent-to-own lease. And uh, from our findings, we see that currently 50 to 60% of the installations are based on outright purchase, whereas others uh, are based on leasing and very few on PPA contracts. Given all of these, this background that we now have on the market, we further looked into, so what has enabled this growth since 2014, 15, as you, if you remember the graph that I had showed earlier, it, some of the initial projects began in 2010, but it actually, the market actually picks up around 2014, 2015. The primary driver of this is obviously the basic incentive of reduced electricity bills for the consumer and more stable power through substitution. While there are many different estimates of what is the extent of savings involved, a reasonable estimate is a 10% saving on energy bills. However, the figures vary a lot depending on the customer, the type, size of installation, how well is the system optimized, is it being well maintained or not? So it's also very difficult to generalize this. Second is availability of finance as a catalyst. Um, as mentioned earlier, Definitely almost 50-60% of the installations are self-financed by the consumer through either a bank loan uh, or through other programs available. But uh, a lot of external funding uh, has been helpful, especially for larger sized projects, which are above 500 kilowatt. Um, and 
we have mapped out the financiers earlier and we also see that relatively larger portfolios are of those for example of sunref program which is supported by the french development agency channeling funds through kenyan commercial banks cross boundary energy that's working in partnership with solar century mostly on projects above 500 kilowatt and also we see solarize africa is coming up as an important player working in partnership with premier solar group operating in kenya and uganda the third factor we also see that despite the demand is also a very strong network of EPC and ONM firms in Kenya that have aggressively pursued the market and leveraged on this growing demand experimented with new implementation models we mapped 21 firms and interviewed some of them in depth to find that three key strategies were being pursued by some of these businesses first they were actively collaborating and forming networks uh, signing exclusive partnership agreements and also supporting each other with manpower resources uh, second, they capitalize on niche advantages. So there are some companies that only focused on target clients, such as only corporates or only the horticulture sector, uh, or only projects below 200 kilowatt or above 500 kilowatt. And third, some of the companies also offer very unique, innovative products and services, either in the form of integrated solutions, data analytics support, among others. Finally, we see two other sets of drivers for the fourth one being the policy driver that also served as an indirect incentive to the CNI market. First within that being the mandatory energy audits that were introduced as part of the energy management regulations, which led to a lot of increased consumer awareness about electricity billing, consumption patterns, etc. And second is the investment deductions on capital expenditure that the manufacturing industries could claim, which included solar equipment. Additional drivers which also contributed to the growth include the growing trend of adopting green practices, especially witnessed among multinationals and lodges, and also in the horticulture industry where the export markets associates a higher markup price for greater eco ratings. While all of this holds true, there are also a number of challenges that the market has been experiencing, uh, some of which include Firstly, limitations in the expertise pertaining to designing systems optimally and carrying out proper ONM, the lack of which has also resulted in complaints from some power consumers. Second is a constant complaint of limited financing options for both the consumers as well as in particular for the solar PV firms operating in the market in the form of, uh, these are in the form of working capital funding with limited collateral, uh, asset-based lending options instead of cash flows, um, among others. Third is the unrealistic proposals and price offerings by PV firms uh, to the power consumers due to high competition. With, um, and fourth is discrepancies in the PPAs and leasing contracts uh, and lack of standardization among the contractual conditions that are being agreed upon. Um, and fifth is, is also more of a potential risk, a potential political issue, as also one of the reviewers of our report point put it, that the reluctance by utility to lose their best and most stable consumers substituting grid intake, which is also something to uh, keep in mind. I would like to conclude this presentation with a few reflections and uh, some positive lessons as well from the CNI market. We tend to focus a lot on the barriers, so this was also an opportunity to, for, for us to take some learnings from this sector and this country. First, it's definitely a very inspiring trend to see more and more businesses embracing solar PV, uh, which I'm hoping it inspires other businesses across the continent. So it's important to share experiences and learnings from uh, this case. Second, there's definitely an increased confidence among the private sector firms and financiers to venture into and invest broadly in energy efficiency solutions, offering vertically integrated services, adopting ICT, digital tools, et cetera. Third, it's important to have the perspective that these developments did not happen over time, overnight. And while we see an increased growth only in the past five, seven years in this market segment, 
the effort to increase solar uptake, to introduce various energy efficiency measures, to streamline licensing certifications, etc., has been going on well over a decade. And a lot of foundational work has been put in by the regulatory authority and other organizations. Fourth, we also witness a stronger presence and niche established by Kenyan-owned SMEs with strong subcontractor links. Beyond international companies, at least 50 to 60% of the firms active in this market are Kenyan, which points to a number of things, but more importantly, a greater competitive spirit among these firms and a stronger local network. With this, I conclude my presentation. Thank you all for listening. And I'll now pass on the screen to the next speaker, Hind. Thank you, Lakshmi, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so my name is Hindu Idrissi, and I work for the Energy Finance Unit in the Africa Office of UNEP, the United Nations Environment Program. I'm based in Nairobi, and today I will be talking about the current state of the financing opportunities for captive power in Kenya. So before we start, I'd like to make a quick introduction on the work of UNEP in the captive power space uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, we have been in partnership with the Fund for School UNEP Collaborating Center, uh, implementing a project called Clean Captive Installations for Industrial Clients uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. It's happening in four countries, Ghana, Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa. This is a project that is funded by the International Climate Initiative of Germany, ET. And this project started in 2019. It will run for four years. And um, as part of this project, we're currently finalizing our country market studies. So the Kenya one will be published soon as well. And we will soon be launching an open call for proposal to support the implementation of at least one pilot project per country. So please stay tuned uh, as we will announce it on our website uh, that you can see here, captiverenewables-africa.org. Uh, turning to the subject, uh, in Kenya, the clean captive power uptake is strong and growing. As Lakshmi said in her presentation, there's more than 100 captive power solar PD systems already installed for CNI clients in Kenya. We know that at least 17 of them have a capacity above 500 kilowatt peak each, uh, while the majority are small scale. There is still a strong potential for captive power. Uh, KPLC has registered in 2018 over 3,900 customers in their SCNI tariff categories, which represent the potential universe for captive power. In the manufacturing sector alone, there's over 6,000 companies, but 800 of them are having an annual turnover of over $1 million, uh, which indicates the high potential. Add to this that grid tariffs are not expected to decrease in the future, uh, as it was uh, as described in the least cost power development plan of 2017, and that the incentives that are being put in place by the government, such as the time of use structures and the tax incentives, have not yet been taken upon by the CNI customers. We um, believe that captive solar PV market is most likely to stay competitive and stable in the future. So let me now jump into the heart of the subject, financing captive installations in Kenya. Um, there's three main stakeholders when it comes to financing captive PV. First, commercial banks, the commercial banking uh, sector. And to date, there's only a few commercial banks in Kenya that are involved in financing renewable energy captive installations. Captive power projects, uh, are perceived as high risk, which is further compounded by the interest rate cap that was set by the Kenyan Central Bank, resulting in maximum interest rates of 13 to 14 uh, percent. Because of this interest rate cap, the, 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 the bank's headroom has been reduced for structuring finance deals with small and medium-sized enterprises. The pioneering commercial banks lending to renewable energy projects have done so in partnership with SunRef, uh, the French uh, Development Agency program. Uh, there's five commercial banks that have participated. Only three of them are active today, which are Diamond Trust Bank, Commercial Bank of Africa, and Cooperative Bank of Kenya. Um, we've uh, reported that uh, as of 2016, there were around 25 megawatts that have been financed 
uh, by these three banks for an amount of $44 million. But those numbers do not include the latest project that has been funded by commercial banks under SunRef, for which the details are still confidential. So we know that, for example, Cooperative Bank announced in 2019 that it has a portfolio of over $100 million under the SunRef program, which is exciting for the years to come. And it's, it's also worth noting that there's other uh, captive projects that have been financed completely outside of the SunRef program uh, through con conventional lending uh, terms. Let me turn to the development finance institutions. Um, there's two main ones that I'd like to discuss today. The first one is SunRef, as I've been saying, which has been catalytic for the sector. So just a brief overview. Um, this program was established in East Africa, so Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania in 2011 for an amount of 30 million euros. It was extended for an additional 126 million euros. And in, in Kenya, SunRef is hosted by CAM, the Kenya Association of Manufacturers. It offers long-term debt in US dollars at a 5 to 6% interest rate. Through participating commercial banks, it also offers capacity building for those banks. Uh, we know that the third phase of SunRef financing is expected to be launched soon, and they actually announced in 2019 that they were planning a local currency facility in Kenyan shillings. The, the joint crediting mechanism um, is a, a Japanese government-funded program in Kenya. The program that has focused mostly on solar PV projects at the IPP or independent power producer or captive system level. So financing is done through a subsidy that covers up to 30% of capital expenditures and is dispersed as results-based finance and in exchange for emission reduction certificates. Um, and third, I would like to turn to private financiers uh, who have been catalytic for the sector as well. Um, so as for private financiers operating in the captive PV market, they operate mainly through corporate financing and usually they do not engage in project development, leaving this role to EPC companies or ESCO. And there's been numerous instances of uh, private financier establishing strong partnership with EPCs and or ESCOs, for example, cross boundary energy and solar century. And this is being done to offer a wider breadth of solutions to customers to, inc to help increase market penetration, uh, to reduce the cost and standardize the processes of developing captive projects. Turning to financing models, uh, from the point of view of a commercial and industrial client, there's, there's two main options, finance your system on balance sheet or off balance sheet. Um, I'll go quickly over those since Lakshmi has, uh, has introduced them in the earlier presentation. If, so, uh, if the client decides to go for on-balance sheets, which is what we call here outright purchase, uh, the, cl the client purchases the solar PV up front and uh, it's financed by either the company capital or by debt, and that debt could be granted either by commercial banks or by some private financiers. So we know, for example, that Solarize Africa uh, does asset financing. It's also worth noting uh, for on balance sheets uh, uh, scheme that the vast majority of captive system in Kenya, over 70%, have been financed through outright purchase. But again, many of them are of very small scale. On the other hand, having its captive installation financed off balance sheet is an innovative way to reduce the financing burden on the client. This could be done through operating lease, financing lease, which we call rent to, end, or rent to own, or PPA. Um, so for the operating lease, the client makes little or no upfront payment and the lease period spans several years. Uh, at the end of the lease period, the end user can either purchase the system uh, or extend the lease or the developer removes the plans from its premises. This is a model that is mainly used uh, in Kenya by companies such as the Solarize Africa and Ashton Field Solar. For the financing lease model, um, rent to own, the client makes a small upfront capital, usually it's about 20 to 30% uh, in Kenya. 
and then a monthly lease payment for the duration of the contract. Uh, the client effectively pays off the solar plant through the monthly payment and receives ownership at the end of the contract. Usually contracts have a long duration of 15 to 25 years. Um, and this is a model that is not used a lot in, in Kenya for now. Um, for the PPA model, it differs from the leasing model in that uh, monthly payments are not fixed, but based on the energy consumed over a long-term contract, usually 15 years or more, by a client to a third-party-owned captive plant. And the plant owner is responsible for developing, financing, building, and operating the plant. And in Kenya, um, only Cross Boundary has publicly announced at least two 15-year PPAs for captive system at client facility. Overall, in Kenya, solar leasing, uh, financing and operating leases, appears to have a high potential for growth. So to date, we have Cross Boundary uh, via Solar Africa, but also Maris via Equator Energy, Ecoligo, and Solarize Africa that have been the most active in providing financing solution, either these or PPF or Capit Solar uh, PV installations. We favor capital via primary solar, solar solutions, and Sunfender appear to have been increasing their activities as well. Uh, and we know that in some instances, there's different financing firms that have teamed up on specific projects, so for example, Ecoligo and Aria Capital. Um, turning to the financing barriers, um, the, the main financing barriers that we see are fourfold. The first one is not really financing, but still is very much linked to the potential of the market. The regulatory uncertainties that uh, uh, are present at the moment uh, with the new uh, 2019 Energy Act, uh, namely to know whether or not the, the sweet spot below one megawatt uh, for leasing uh, is still um, is still possible, and the fact that the Act introduces provisions such as aggregate installed capacity limits for licensing exemptions, where both diesel generator and clean captive power plants would come together. Um, the second barrier that we see is the, the, the typical commercial lending terms in Kenya. Um, it, it involves relatively short tenures between three to seven years and the requirement for collateral and, and guarantees. And in particular, the requirements of collateral, um, we've noticed that financing by local banks is usually through full recourse loans that require guarantees and collateral. And um, they usually do not take, for example, for example, a captive power system as a collateral, which means that the bank needs other assets uh, attached to cover the loan, which proves to be uh, difficult for the commercial and industrial clients. Um, and the risk guarantee facilities that are available in Kenya, such as um, ARIES of the French Development Agency, um, have not been very successful because with the interest rate uh, cap that was uh, that limits the, the, the loan interest rate to 13 to 14 percent, including a risk guarantee facility in a loan will usually eat into the margin of the bank and bank usually would prefer less risky project that ones that the ones needing a risk guarantee scheme so then the currency risk is also uh, to take into account so private financiers mainly use hard currencies euros or dollars which limits lending to businesses that earn in kenyan shillings since it, since it would add for an exchange risk and um, it, it, as a way forward, local currency financing would be a way to unblock funding to local businesses. As I said earlier, SunRef has announced plans to introduce a line of credit in Kenyan Shilling in its third round of financing. Uh, so that's, that's exciting. And last but not least, the lack of awareness from TNI clients is important. So. Um, it would be important that clients understand the economic and financial benefits of captive power and how it can help with their own finances.
And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And I will now hand over to Mr. Nixon Bukashi from EPRA to share insights uh, on the policy and regulatory aspects of the captive PD market. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to this webinar. Uh, my name is Nixon Bukachi. I work for the Energy and Petroleum Regulatory Authority. I'm going to take us through the commercial and industrial uh, photovoltaic uh, systems, policy and regulations in Kenya, uh, what we are doing to regulate the sector and what the players are supposed to comply with as they, as they set up the various types of projects that they want to do in this space. So briefly, I will take us through who EPRA is. Uh, we are the single sector energy regulator. We do both technical and economic regulation. Just to highlight a few uh, aspects that we regulate, we do regulate generation, importation, exportation, transmission, distribution, and supply of electrical energy. We do regulate the production, conversion, distribution, supply, and the marketing and use of renewable energy in Kenya. Also, we do some aspects of upstream petroleum, which we'll not dwell on. So our mandate is basically drawn from the Energy Act of 2019. Uh, so the Energy Act, we start with the Kenyan constitution, then we come to the Energy Act, and specifically for C and I, we look at section 117 and section 163, part one of the Energy Act of 2019. So these are the areas that I will, the, the sections of the act that I will highlight in the subsequent presentations. And also to support the activities of the, the act, we have various specific regulations that give us requirements, one of which is the electricity licensing regulations of 2012. So the regulations specifies the specific requirements that the people setting up or the company setting up uh, energy projects in Kenya are supposed to comply with. And then we also have the solar photovoltaic systems regulations of 2012 that do provide for licensing of EPCs, the people who are involved in the procurement, that the importation, manufacturing, installation of solar photovoltaic systems in Kenya. Uh, uh, before I proceed to this slide, I think I should mention that currently, because the Energy Act came into place in 2019, most of the sections, most of the regulations that we have in place are currently under review. And I think our stakeholders will be calling you to give us input, especially for C and I, that will be part of the electricity licensing regulations that you're developing now. So to highlight section 117 of the Energy Act of 2019, is that a person who wishes to carry out the generation, uh, exploration, explore, exportation, importation, transmission, and distribution, uh, retail, and supply of electricity is required to obtain a license from the Energy uh, and Petroleum Regulatory Authority. So I'll use authority to mean the regulator in Kenya. So uh, provided the person shall not, the person shall not require, however, the authorization if they are installing less than one megawatt for own consumption. So we should note that because we'll use that when you are fishing, uh, we are trying to trash out the requirements for C and I. And then section 163.1 provides that all contracts for sale of electrical energy, uh, uh, distribution, uh, transmission and distribution network services between licensees and retailers and eligible consumers be submitted to the authority for approval before exclusion. So basically, if someone is doing uh, a contract between him and a consumer, the, the, the developer and the consumer, in this case, then they're supposed to have uh, the, the PPA or the contract that they have between the two of them uh, approved or submitted to the authority for approval before they are able to execute uh, that contract. So, this gives us the interpretation of the sections that we have. So basically, in uh, out of this, we do develop regulations, which I've already mentioned, that the electricity licensing regulations, and the guiding principle for tariff approval uh, is, is to ensure that the tariff is just and reasonable, and should be able to ensure the financial integrity of the project, attract capital, 
for the development uh, and also be able to compensate for the investors who are involved in the development of that project. So basically, we look at both sides, the tariff being charged by the developer on the customer or the end user should be uh, uh, should be fair. The, the project should, of course, be able to be executed in terms of finances. It should be able to attract financial investment, either equity and debt, or even crowd financing. And then the project should be able to operate. So we should be able to meet the O and M cost. And also the investor should be able to get a fair return. So this uh, fair return then is dependent on from time to time, but in most cases it should be around 14% uh, return for the investment. Just to interpret that section, the reason why we regulate the tariff is to ensure fairness between the players, which I have already mentioned. And an example would be what we do for mini grid operators. Uh, and in Kenya, we do regulate mini grids of any capacity provided someone is distributing electricity in a given uh, village. So in this case, or in a given locality, then we look at the tariff and we ensure that the tariff, we try to ensure that the tariff is acceptable to the end user. But there is a disclaimer here because for specifically C and I, we are looking at consumers and sellers who understand the space. So in this case, what we are trying to do is, as much as we'll be looking at, or we want to look at the power purchase agreements between the two of them, we envision a, a situation where the two parties understand what they are getting into. So we would want that this, uh, these players are able to, to agree in terms of what they will be charging each other. They take into account aspects of uh, levies, I think the levies are provided for in the act on which levies can be charged for such development when someone is selling electricity. And also they should be able to take into account aspects to do with taxes. So this specifically where the project uh, involves sale of electricity between one player and the other. And in this case, it can be of any capacity starting from zero to the maximum that would have. So, but in cases where the the development is done specifically for for own use then there there's no need provided it's less than one megawatt for the agreement to be approved by the authority so that clarifies the same in terms of what should be considered and i've already mentioned that during the development of the tariff the player the parties involved uh, the ppa the parties involved in this case should be able to look at cases where there would be need to charge electricity levies. So they trash out the levies that are relevant to solar photovoltaic and also the requirement to be compliant in terms of taxes that they should pay to the uh, national government. So this is just to highlight, uh, this was supposed to be a poll, but because this is not a live presentation, uh, I will skip this, side, this, this slide, but basically it gives us the different scenarios that would uh, happen in a typical project where one would build, for example, a developer, would re, uh, developer will provide the funds and build a project. Then the facility owner pays to own the install, installation. So in this case, for a project that is less than one megawatt, then we will assume the owner will be paying for the loan. He will not be paying for the project. So in this case, they will be paying a fixed amount of money for a specific period of time before they own the project. So for a project that is less than one megawatt, then in that case, they will not require to get an express approval from us, but they will just be required to notify us and also have the EPC uh, that is doing the project licensed when they are doing the project. The, the EPC that is doing the project should be should have been licensed, which is a standard requirement for all developers who are involved in the installation of solar photovoltaic. And then the second scenario is where the developer funds the project, builds, operates, and sells electricity. And this is what I've already mentioned, where if you're selling electricity to a third party, then in that case, the contract is supposed to be approved by the authority, regardless of the of the capacity. And then 
for capacities that are more than one megawatt, those ones are supposed to apply for a license for all the three scenarios that we have. And lastly, if you are the developer just develops the project without necessarily uh, getting any financing from any other person, so they develop and own. So if the project is less than one megawatt, then they no, no need an express approval from us, but the EPC should be licensed. But if it's one megawatt and above, then it requires uh, a license. So in summary, what I'm saying, we need uh, a license for all projects. We need the developers to have licenses for all projects that are above one megawatt, regardless of the arrangement. But in cases where the project is less than one megawatt uh, and there is a transaction where they are selling electricity to another party, then in that case, they will need both a PPA approval, that's the contract approval, and a license to be able to sell electricity. So they'll be issued with a generation license to sell electricity and also they'll be issued with uh, a tariff approval on the tariff that they'll be charging the end user. But if the project is less than one megawatt and there's no sale of electricity, where it means the, either the facility outrightly owns the system or the facility pays fixed installments, uh, the model they usually refer to leasing, to own the system after a number of years, maybe two years or three years, then in that case, if it's less than one megawatt, they just have to notify the authority and at the same time, they pay, they notify the authority. determined tariff to the facility. So the first thing that they will need, of course, is to get an uh, approval from EPRA, that's approval from the authority of given the general requirements. They need a tariff approval. So the tariff that they will be selling electricity should be filed with EPRA. And also uh, they need the project registered with EPRA. They need to pay taxes and levies related to electricity cell in Kenya, which are provided for in the, in the Energy Act. And also they need to have a license, a licensed EPC doing undertaking the development of the project. Uh, so when I go to the next section, it will be the specific requirements now to get those licenses. But in a case where you are doing a project that is less than one megawatt, uh, we don't need to approve the PPA. Uh, we don't need to approve the tariff. We don't need to issue with the license, but the project needs to be registered with EPRA uh, for data collection. That's with the authority. You don't need to pay taxes uh, directly on electricity sales, but you need to pay the other taxes as a company, corporate taxes and the likes. And also you have to have a licensed EPC implement the project. Uh, and license Lastly, where there is an outright purchase of project that is less than one megawatt, you don't need to submit it to EPRA for approval. Uh, that is both the license, you don't need a license, you don't need a tariff approval. Yes, the project should be registered uh, with the authority because it's one mandate of the authority to collect energy data. You don't need to pay taxes and levies associated with electricity sale, but you need to pay the other taxes that are attached to you operating a company in Kenya. And also you need to have a licensed EPC implement the project. So as I go downwards, I will go to the specific requirements that are, are required for each of the project and try to highlight why we need those requirements. Of course, any project has to be designed and, uh, and uh, approved by a competent engineer in Kenya we have uh, bodies that register engineers. So in this case, the project should be 
stamped or approved by an engineer. So the engineer will go through the designs, through the drawings, through the safety requirements to ensure that the project uh, is safe for operation in the country. So that is a standard requirement for all projects, whether we you are submitting them to EPRA for approval, whether you are not submitting them to EPRA for approval. Uh, of course, you have to do an undertaking. Uh, uh, you have to give us the details of the project, where it's located, uh, the capacity, the coordinates of the project. So that's a standard requirement. You will need a lease agreement between you or a title deed between you and the facility that you're installing the system with. So it's, it's a good document to have just for safety of the undertaking on how uh, how long the facility is leasing you the facility, the, the land or the roof that you're going to use to do your installation. So whether you're submitting the document to EPRA or not, I think in my opinion is a good document that you should be able to sign off uh, with the facility. Uh, of course, these are the requirements, the business registration. They come in for cases where you are doing the project for installation, for approval with EPRA, but they might not be necessary uh, depending on your arrangement with the facility to have the project, to have those requirements in place. So I'll share this so that you're able to go through. If you're bringing a project for approval at EPRA, you'll need to give a gazette notice uh, newspaper no, uh, announcement in two widely uh, two newspapers of wide circulation before you submit the project to us uh, for licensing. So that will be required, but it might it's not required for the other uh, form of arrangements, especially if you are doing a project of less than one one megawatt. So lastly, what I wanted to comment about is on the aspect of going for a NEMA approval. I think it's up there, yes. So if you are doing any project in Kenya, it's good to get uh, approval from the National Environmental Management Authority. This is the authority that is in charge of looking at the environmental and social impacts of projects. Uh, you can either get a license, you can apply for a license after doing a full environmental and environmental impact assessment, or you can seek for an exemption. In cases where you think the project is too small and it doesn't have uh, significant impacts on the environment. So we have seen situations where the environmental body has been able to give uh, exemptions and they do that in writing, exempting the project from conducting an environmental and social impact assessment. So cases where you see the project has no significant impacts, you can explore this avenue, but uh, in any case, you need to get an approval from the authority before you, that's the National Environmental Management Authority, before you execute, you actually execute the, the project. So for cases where the project is above one megawatt, this, is, this table gives us below one megawatt, but for cases where it's above one megawatt, then the first column where we are talking about the power purchase agreement uh, requirements apply, except for the requirement on approval for sale of electricity and also for approval for the tariff. So it means if you're applying for a license, then all the requirements that are highlighted in the first column do apply. So with that, thank you very much for your time. And I hope this has been helpful. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Sylvester Makaka from the energy desk at the Kenya Association of Manufacturers. And to take, give you an overview of the C and I market, the way we see it from Kenya Association of Manufacturers. Just to introduce who is Kenya Association of Manufacturers. We are a business membership organization representing manufacturing in Kenya, established 1959. So we are uh, 60 years now, and the membership has crossed 1,000 mark, of which 90% are all in manufacturing. Within the KM, we have an established center that is focusing on energy efficiency, renewable energy, circular economy, 
and, and operational efficiencies. This center then has been able to be in operation for the last 15 years or so, focusing on uh, farm level energy audits, pre-feasibility on solar and PV and uh, other renewable energy, feasibility studies, training and capacity building and awareness creation across manufacturing value chains and integrated resource and industrial process audits. So far, we have been able to finance close to 12, up to, this is up to last year, this program is still ongoing. We have been able to finance up to 12 solar PV projects through our partnership with Sunref and AFD. We are also uh, financed other renewable energy projects. Uh, up to last year, 2019, we had crossed 10. And then we also finance or arrange for finance uh, energy efficiency projects. These are targeting technology and renewable energy in, in industry. So just to take you to our view on the, the solar and solar utilization, we have an, a range of projects that we have been part of. And these are on so, uh, commercial malls, manufacturing, and also general small, small installations for solar. What we have noted is that the utilization really depends on the nature of the business, the design, and more so to do with the O and M arrangement. Solar requires a bit of O and M, and if that O and M is not well taken care of, then utilization is impaired. So we look at what is the design from the word go. Is it optimally designed to serve? the business is it optimally designed to give you op uh, maximum yield through the year based on your operational hours through the year but generally in manufacturing it also depends on the power quality because for most grid type solar systems you need some external source to give you a base from which then you can be able to run your manufacturing processes. So grid stability is very paramount in running solar systems in manufacturing and where grid stability is not available and then manufacturers have to tie in with diesel generator or some other form of generator. So generally there is really a need, a real need that uh, then what happens on when manufacturing is down, especially over the weekends and holidays when manufacturing is not at peak, what happens to the generation from, from solar systems? We are, we are trying to see how best we can make this a bankable solution so that solar energy generated when manufacturing is low, when commercial malls are not in operation, when schools are not running, can be banked into the grid so that then can be redeemed at a later stage. We also looking at uh, what is the, what is, which scale works best. And we took a sample from one of our projects, some of our projects, and we saw that the bigger the size, and big here is relative because we looked at the scale from 300 kilowatt peak to 1.2. 1.2 megawatt peak and we saw that on a very on the smaller scale the utilization depending on the cycle of operations of this facility the utilization is anything between 60 to 65 percent that means 35 percent of the design capacity either is being generated is available but it's not being put to good use. When you go to the medium now, medium sized uh, solar plants, one megawatt, 500 
kilowatt peak and above up to one megawatt, you realize then the utilization again improves because then the load there is much higher and you are able to draw when it's available, but still they are hit by the low peaks when industry is not operating and that energy is available but not utilized. Then we have the installations of one, one megawatt 1.2 is the sample size we took and we looked at what has been the performance and that performance comes to slightly higher crossing 80% of the design capacity. That means that uh, where the load matching and the timing all come and agree, then utilization is almost equal to design capacity. But where now we come to smaller systems, the matching doesn't really work. And maybe we are looking at how best do we resize or do we design the system so that we can have maximum utilization. My next slide is talking about the solar dependency. And this is basically an, a factor of, as I mentioned, the manufacturing, manufacturing cycle, looking at the weekends, holidays, then there is the, the constant need for support so that it can, it can power industry and especially the heavy industries cannot rely on solar in isolation or islanded mode. Then there is that imperative that the grid must be available so that then whatever uh, solar generation is there is supported by the grid. My next slide is, is about my actually concluding. And in conclusion, we are looking at cost of solar, whether it is PPA, whether it is lease to own, whether it is on purchase, must then be competitive to the cost of the grid and the grid power and other generation sources so that we are not looking at solar cost in comparison to, uh, to grid plus taxes plus all other physical incentives. Solar cost should be competitive in terms of LCOE, uh, the levelized cost of energy from that source so that we are comparing this like to like. And we have seen many coming in to look at all the lumped up costs that relate to electricity, whether it's fuel cost, whether it is uh, levies, whether it's taxes and bundling that into one box and saying this is the actual Kenya energy cost. This can change. And if they change, say tomorrow we, we do away with a levy X, what will happen to the solar prices? Will we remain locking an industrialist or a, a mall with a high solar cost? once the tax law or the levies have been removed. The market has actually been liberalized and the liberalization has allowed that uh, you can wake up and install your own solar system captive without, uh, without much, a, a, a lot of uh, bureaucracy or having to go for licensing and all that. But, as liberalized as it is, it's still a regulated market. By regulation, I mean, we need to know what is the price you are bringing in your material at, uh, or your project at, so that it remains competitive. As manufacturers, we are looking at the price element critically because that's what determines. And for sure, these prices we are locked in for, for the entire period of the, of the PPA. So we are looking at it in terms of can, it, can that price hold for the rest of the PPA period, whether it's 10, 15, or, or 20 years or 25? We are also looking at how is, what is the best mechanism for de-risking solar and renewable energy projects. Uh, de-risking will make a lot of sense in the sense that then you need to look at the collaterals that the investors or the project owners are asking for and the financiers are asking for, whether the risking solar and renewable projects will give some leverage 
to the to the manufacturers not to give a lot of collateral and high collateral basically we are saying most of this what the financiers are asking for are already in the bank mortgaged so what happens when a, a project owner or a manufacturer doesn't have a collateral to give and what mechanisms are there to the risk so that then we can increase market penetration then we are we are advocating as KM for net metering. Net metering will basically improve on the performance of solar PV systems so that when it is not, the energy generated is not in put to good use at the farm level, then it can be banked or it can be sold to, to the grid and then redeemed when it's really required. And with that, I want to thank you very much for listening to me as I hand over to our next speaker, Geoffrey. Thank you. Good day, everyone. My name is Geoffrey Rono, and I will be taking you through um, our experience as a Kenyan um, EPC company in the, in the C&I space. Um, so to start us off, um, let's kind of tell you who, uh, who is Opgen. So Ofgen is a Kenyan-based uh, EPC company. Um, we've been here now for about um, uh, six, seven, eight years, and we are a strong focus on the on the C&I sector. And the kind of services we offer to our clients, um, as you can see on the screen there, the first one is a solar PV. We are a solar PV developer, um, and we basically help our clients to um, understand how solar PV can be of use to them, what benefits can it bring, and also um, we also um, then would assist with the construction process uh, uh, of the project. Uh, we also do offer um, energy management services. Uh, typically, our clients would, would seek to understand what kind of energy they're consuming and why, why and how is that energy being consumed within the facility, where is the energy going, and, and also um, help, helping them with the compliance in terms of um, statutory uh, energy audits. We also do offer energy monitoring solutions as uh, clients would like to be able to understand um, on a day-to-day -day basis where their energy sources and their energy use in the facility. Uh, we also do um, have striking a keen, keen, keen um, interest in energy storage and uh, battery storage technologies have, have come and, and now are quite, um, um, there's, there's a big interest in the market for energy storage and we um, have set up ourselves as um, to offer this service to our clients, again, to understand whether energy storage is an option for them, and if so, what size, uh, what configuration, and what are the benefits of this uh, technology uh, would be to our clients. And finally, we do offer o &M services um, uh, to projects we have constructed or projects which have been constructed by third parties. A good example here is we offer um, o &M services to the 500 kilowatt solar PV project at the UN headquarters in Nairobi, where we are the o &M, uh, contractor. For that and we help our clients optimize the performance of their of the of the plant um what has been our journey in the market uh, we've been here now since about 2012 um and in the early years between 2012 and 2014 it was really it was really um trying to look at is it the right time now for this technology would would would, would clients be willing to invest or at least enjoy solar energy savings um and in that period really we saw a few um, projects taking off, including the one at the UN, uh, Strathmore University, and a few others which served to create more awareness in the market about uh, captive use solar. Um, and you know, and also this time we we had some regulations around uh, energy management. We also had regulations on on solar PV, although more more to regulate the market, and also on uh, solar thermal. So it, it did create some awareness in the market as to the possibility of this technology. Um, and in the in the in the in the in the second stage there, where we I'll, I'll call it early stage, um, where we were now formally founded and, and really trying to now to speak to our clients and and convince them that captive view solar is is the way to go and it can bring you savings and has got uh, a number of benefits. Um, but it was still a journey because most clients would would a uh, not have the funding for these uh, projects or would still view solar as a a small technology when often would be asked how does can solar run a motor in an industry um, um, is it is it reliable and the, also the concept of grid solar would be very difficult to pass across as the solar industry in kenya has 
predominantly been in the domestic sector. So to try and break it into the commercial space was, um, for most clients, was quite difficult to to appreciate. And I guess some of those um, early adopters really helped uh, to to drive the point home. Uh, in this stage, also we then managed to uh, form some key partnerships. One of them being with our biggest client, uh, Serena Hotels. And also on the side of financing, we, we then formed a partnership with the, that, at that time with the Metal Solar, at least to to break the barrier of um, this high cost of, of technology uh, for our clients. In the period from 2017, we then saw our portfolio grow. And, and uh, in that period, we managed to implement with our partners uh, a number of projects, on-grid and off-grid projects, all up to about uh, two megawatts in, 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 in total. Um, and subsequently, um, in this period now where we are, we, we are seeing a, a bigger uptake in the market. Um, and we, we do forecast that those numbers, as Lakshmi earlier presented, will definitely keep growing. And we have set up ourselves to, um, to support our clients in, in terms of adopting solar PV. Uh, the next slide shows um, of the projects we have, how are they, what are the characteristics? So we do have in our portfolio about five megawatts of projects. Um, and also um, of these projects, a couple of them actually uh, have come with battery storage, which are about nine megawatt hours uh, in total. Um, the number of projects here, we have about 13 projects in total, adding up to uh, five megawatts. So our average project size is in the range of 400 kilowatts. Um, all rooftop, uh, ground mounted, um, and, and also carport systems. In terms of financing, how have this project been funded? Um, as Alia said, and actually ties up with what uh, was presented earlier, 60% of these have been outright purchases. So the clients and their bankers will put, will put the money in the projects and we then serve the role of the EPC and, and the, and the O&M uh, uh, service provider. Um, however, 40% in our portfolio are, um, are funded, uh, uh, meaning that we fund them uh, together with our partners and we do offer our clients operating leases for up to 20 years. Um, and this would then be implemented under an ESCO where we are also uh, participating in the, in the ESCO. Uh, on, the, on the other uh, analysis there on, on, on your right hand side there, uh, we are quite active in the region. So however, a bulk of our projects, about 90% of our projects are, are in Kenya and the remainder in Uganda, uh, South Sudan and, and Rwanda. We're hoping also to be in Tanzania soon. Uh, if you look at the bottom uh, row, um, uh, we also we we've been uh, quite fortunate to to have implemented projects which cut across the three categories which Lakshmi earlier presented. The first one there in um, the first one in, in grey there on grid is purely on grid systems where there is no storage. So PV is 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 generated. PV energy comes out during the day and it's consumed by the client. And if if PV is more than the load, we typically curtail it as there's still no net metering. Uh, but there's no net metering capability in Kenya. Um, secondly, uh, in blue there is hybrid systems. These are systems where there is either a weak grid or the client is very keen for 100% power reliability. Um, our biggest project here has been uh, a 1.5 megawatt project with uh, 4 megawatts of storage in Western Kenya, where the client uh, feels that you know, power instability is a major cost and is costing them a lot of money. Therefore, the client is keen to is keen to um, secure their power supply, is keen to supply the power supply on site. But again, the system here would be um, on grid. So here we we we're looking at about 60% RE fraction and 40% uh, from the grid. On the first case on on grid, we typically see about 30% RE fraction. Um, and the last last case there in orange. Uh, these are typically off-grid systems uh, where there is no grid and the client will typically be running uh, generators uh, and the PV system here comes in to, to supplement, actually to, to take over the system and the generator serves as the backup. So here we typically see an RE fraction of um, 80% or thereabouts or slightly under or slightly over. Um, and it's good to know that yet I believe that our, the systems we have in our portfolio are the largest in the market so far, to the, to the best of our knowledge. Uh, the, the biggest is about 650 kilowatt um, uh, PV and about 1.3 megawatt hours of, of storage, which we have implemented with our partners uh, for, for one of our lodges in Kenya. 
if you look at the sectors there, uh, at, the, at the bottom corner there, agricultural sector is the is the dominant sector, uh, rightly so, because Kenya is um is is, is big in agriculture, um, and this is in the in the tea sector, and also in the horticulture, um, followed by um, hospitality, again because of our game lodges, uh, which are typically off grid and would need energy, and the rest really is in uh, automotive, commercial, and uh, and in the health sector, uh, that makes it up uh, to about 100 percent. In when you look uh, going forward now, what what is our view and what are the issues we see in the market? And just to add what the colleagues earlier said, um, there is definitely a need for clarity on regulation uh, for the C and I sector. Uh, there is still no clarity, um, uh, you know, in terms of whether um, whether, uh, for example, doing a PPA is what what are the requirements there for doing a C and I PPA? There is just clearly no no clarity on that, and also. Yeah, so, Net metering would be a big, uh, a big step forward for the sector. Um, uh, also, um, on the issues of funding, which has been adequately addressed by uh, earlier on, um, local currency still remains a major um, a concern for most of our clients. They would like to contract uh, in local currency, and I'm happy to hear that um, perhaps Andrew will will uh, be having a will be having a, a local currency option uh, in the near future. Um, also, I think important here to note is also what is the state of the Kenya power uh, going forward, and uh, it's, it, it is in, it is indeed as earlier alluded that uh, C and I solar is seen as coming to take or to seek the best of the of the clients in, in the Kenya power portfolio, but maybe not so because well, perhaps there could be some complementarity here between the grid and, and the C and I sector, and um, and perhaps that's that's a discussion to be had um, because the sector is growing and the numbers are are, are, are getting bigger. And uh, there's just, it, in a way, it still seems Ill illegitimate. So they just need to um, establish a, a, a working relationship with, the, with, with Kenya Power. And, uh, and one of the comments there also, as we mentioned earlier, is client expectations. I think clients have got uh, some very high expectations as to the solar fraction in the system, also the savings. Uh, and sometimes you go and the client expects that actually they can achieve 50% saving overall on, the, on, their, on their bill. Which is quite difficult to achieve uh, at the moment um, for many reasons. Uh, so there, there is um, still um, awareness required uh, from the client perspective as to what solar can do and what savings are actually feasible and what can be seen to be overpromising, which may not be uh, possible. And the final comment there is, uh, as we as Ali mentioned, is uh, O and M is a major um, is a major requirement for PV systems. And a number of systems in Kenya uh, seem to lack this, and has created a, a bad reputation for, for PV systems. So um, this is also ties to the issue of client expectations. Uh, I alluded. Um, um, in, in conclusion, therefore, uh, we've, we view the market as a, a, as a bullish going forward, and uh, and uh, we see the C and I sector growing and growing significantly in leaps and bounds over the next couple of years. Uh, I will now hand, hand over to for the next. Uh, Presenter. Um, okay, uh, thank you for all the great presentations. Um, we will now start our Q&A session. And like I mentioned in the beginning of the webinar, you can um, you can ask all your questions in the chat box to the right. And if your question is directed um, to a specific speaker, please indicate um, who the question is for. The Q&A will be moderated by our first speaker, Lakshmi Pamidipati. Yeah, thanks, Louisa. I'll just take over from here. There are many questions that are pointed to the regulatory authority. So I'll just move on. Maybe I can uh, pose the first question to Hind. So there's one question on if you have any opinions on which mode is better or preferable within the off balance sheet financing, if it's the PPA or leasing and uh, why? Uh, thank, thanks, Lakshmi. Um, I mean, I have to say it depends on what on what uh, the, the the client wants and the terms of the contract that is offered to him. So PPA, for example, typically are for larger installation, uh, and for leasing, we've met with seven different types of 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 uh, CNI um, facilities. Some of them 
were very happy not having to worry about the system at, at all, uh, quietly enjoying the savings while others, uh, for example, family owned business mostly, uh, would, would rather have a rent to own uh, type of agreement to be able to uh, own the system at the end. And I have to say, it also depends on the um, operation and maintenance arrangements, so we, which can differ from contract to contract. So I don't think there's a, a straight answer to this question. Uh, but overall, uh, overall, off balance sheet does uh, alleviate the financial burden on on the customer. That's for sure. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Hind. Um, maybe a question for uh, Geoffrey, if uh, if you could share a bit on uh, which business model or implementation structure in the CNI PV sector have worked for you. I think also pointing to what you mentioned about the metal solar and also what would be your advice to the domestic firms in Kenya and East Africa with regard to leveraging on this market or even in securing finance in more creative ways, if you have any experiences to share on that. Thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll first share our experience there. Um, in terms of, um, I guess, finding finding the right funding for, for projects, in our experience, it was quite a journey to, um, and has been quite a journey to, to find the right formula. It still is a journey actually to, because clients are different, the plan needs are different. Uh, for example, uh, one. Other clients would, would want, as I said earlier, the currency funding. And if 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 you're in a scenario where there is that is not available, it becomes quite a challenge. Um, other clients' requirements, for example, now is that they would like to have a tariff which um, uh, uh, close to the grid. So if the grid is say 10 shillings, they want always 30% offset or 20% of that. And uh, and to find the right partners who whom you can easily um, Communicate this to and find solutions to your client is quite is um, is often a challenge. Um, however, uh, in our experience, um, we have, we we have, we have basically worked with the, mostly the ESCO model, where we, as the developers and the financier, come together and offer a solution to our clients uh, with Metal Solar for the Serena projects. Uh, that has worked quite well uh, because then it is um, first as the as the developers we bring in the uh, the client. Uh, expectations the financier and the financier is able to understand and appreciate what the client wants and also we also the face of the, we also the face of the of the of the client in front of the financier and that often breaks down the barriers because most financiers as is now are typically um, uh, foreign firms um, and we often find this understanding what the Kenyan market requires and what financiers have in their from their home market. And all, all, we have also seen that most clients in our portfolio pre, still prefer the operating lease model um, and, have, uh, and have no interest in owning the asset in, in, in the near term. Uh, however, most clients will often say that they would just like to have an option in the, in the contract for that in case they, would, they have some extra cash at some point. However, we are seeing more and more clients who are saying, okay, maybe you should give me a short, shorter term lease, so 10 years as, a, as, a, as, as an interest, um, for, as an example. Uh, for, for, you know, and, and this needs, it still requires the financing model to be very flexible because clients are very dynamic and clients are getting many offers. And one day you discuss this and the next day they would like that. So it, it requires a lot of flexibility. And there's just not a standard financing format which has really come out clearly as, as the winning format uh, in the market, uh, Lakshmi. Thanks, Geoffrey. Perhaps I could also point to that there, there's some concerns and questions with regard to net metering and I just also thought this is an occasion to clarify a little bit that uh, in the new Energy Act 2019 there is a there's a support for net metering and for consumers to supply excess capacity back to the grid uh, but when we spoke with the regulatory authority they also clarified that there's an operations committee working on the various regulations in the act which are required to provide guidelines for how to operationalize it within the next two years of its ratification. ratification. So we are looking at 2021, which is the time by when EPRA needs to provide uh, clearer guidelines on the net metering provision. 
It's still unclear how it will be enforced, but it is worth noting that all licensed distributors will have to make net metering services available to any electricity consumer they supply. And the new act also sets a cap of one megawatt, this being the maximum that can be installed and stored on any one project site. So it doesn't necessarily mean selling electricity back to the grid, it refers to also what can be stored on site. What this will mean for projects that have that have already installed above one megawatt and want to benefit from net metering policy uh, remains unclear. Nixon, can you speak and can we hear you? On the aspect of net metering, so the Energy Act of 2019 as it is, does provide for uh, net metering. Currently, we are working on the regulations. In fact, um, I'm charged with doing the regulations at the moment from the authority side. So once the regulations will be ready, then these commercial and industrial projects will be able to feed into the grid uh, and have a transaction between them and the utility. But what is envisioned in the first phase, just to mention, is to bank the electricity without necessarily having financial benefits. Uh, uh, from the utility or from the distributor. So in this case, you'd bank your electricity to the grid and then get it back when you need it, maybe in the during the night when you don't have enough insulation. So just wanted to clarify that point. Maybe uh, I'll now move to Sylvester and if you could share a bit more on the link between the energy audits and the CNI solar PV uptake in the manufacturing industry. If you see if there's a clear uh, evidence established between the two ever since the energy man management regulations have been enforced and how that has led to the rooftop solar PV, but also if you've seen that that hasn't happened as well so far and what, what are the disincentives due to which the uptake hasn't been taken up by the manufacturing sector. Thanks. Energy audits serve to give you an entry level into the facility and assess their respective energy consumption and patterns. Now, we have a pool of energy auditors that are trained in various backgrounds that then will pick the potential for energy savings and then propose based on the findings on the ground and the consumption patterns that one, the resources available and the geographical positioning of that industry and the structural uh, infrastructure that is existing can support solar PV rooftop or they need ground, a, a new ground for that. And then once that report is adopted by the facility, the next level is then the facility owner will request for a uh, a pre feasibility or a full feasibility into the uh, envisaged savings so that then an investment grade uh, proposal is given to, to the facility owner. And that's why uh, energy audit in itself is not an end, it is just an opener to see what is the potential at any facility that then we can escalate to the next level and make it bankable and then take it up for financing if it qualifies. Yes, uh, the enactment of the energy management regulations 2012 opened a new horizon for the energy auditing market because then the designated facilities were obligated by law or by the regulations to do an audit uh, every uh, in the past year and every every three years subsequent. That means that uh, one, you've got to, to identify uh, the potential for savings, and if solar is one of the proposals for cutting on energy cost or saving on energy bill, then that project is escalated in the, in the, in the three years, and the regulations require that part of at least 50% of the recommendations should be implemented. So we have seen solar coming in as a quick win, for manufacturing in terms of implementation, given the intricate balance on energy, energy efficiency uh, technology and equipment 
solar is gaining traction pretty fast because it's a proven technology and it can it can sell quickly and as as long as there is financing and uh, and of course the model of uh, lease to own and it, it becomes a quick sale to them so yes the regulations have helped and if i was just to talk about the the, the designated facilities to date we are talking about uh, 3000 plus designated facilities both commercial and industry that means that those 3000 plus facilities must at least undertake an energy audit every three years to remain compliant and to keep on improving on their energy efficiency and three uh, to comply with the regulations keep on investing in any type of technology that will improve on their energy bill and energy consumption in general and that's the much that uh, the regulations have pushed and I think they are due for review so that we look at what have we learned and where should we take it? Should we make it more mandatory, more punitive, or should we relax? But I think it has been an identifier for what is happening in the industry. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvester. Um, there are a couple of more questions, but maybe um... We may not be able to take all, but maybe a last question to Jeffrey again. Uh, can you elaborate on the point of uh, O&M, which you highlighted in your barriers and constraints? And maybe if you could also link to what exactly are the problems? I mean, is it more towards the lack of uh, skill availability? Why the maintenance aspect is not being taken care of well? Or is it also something to do with the contractual conditions if these things are not being talked up front with the consumer or any other issues as part of it? If you could elaborate on that. Thank you, Lakshmi. Yeah, so so I, I think that they, that there was a misconception that there's a misconception in the market that um, solar PV technology is maintenance free. So once you install it, um, it can sit there and generate power for 20 years. Um, but that's not the case. Um, indeed, it, 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 it requires maintenance, but less maintenance compared to other technologies such as hydro or, uh, or wind technologies, uh, wind turbines. Uh, so in the market, we often see that the o &M issues could vary from, for example, the client has no visibility on what the system is generating. So there is no monitoring on the output and, and the client is unable to uh, realistically, say what 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 the what is the how, how is the plan performing? Um, so it often starts with I guess uh, putting in place a proper monitoring uh, system which can view and display and analyze the energy production from the from the system. It could also be that uh, some devices in the system are um, have malfunctioned or are not working and uh, need to be um, um, uh, rebooted. Typically, the inverters actually require replacement, uh, of, uh, and and the client would. Uh, often, uh, uh, in this case, without an O&M contract in place, would have nowhere to turn to, um, and are left uh, with the system not uh, malfunctioning. The system. It could also be that, you know, the routine maintenance required about uh, normal PV systems, so cleaning of dust, um, uh, checking connections. You know, there could be also a, an insect which has gone in or a rat has bitten a cable. Uh, so this routine maintenance, which are typically monthly, quarterly, or annual actually are required just to ensure the plant meets its uh, performance requirements. Um, but, but the culture or in the sector is still not yet quite um, in place in Kenya. So maybe also some, you know, some best practices and some, uh, some form of uh, client awareness is required to, to make this a compulsory part of the project implementation and project uh, management uh, for the renewable energy project. Um, so we do offer as often these services. And uh, as I earlier mentioned, for example, we uh, are offering this service to one of our, the bigger projects in Nairobi, which is the, uh, the UN headquarters in, in Nairobi. And we are basically assisted to uh, bring that plan back to um, meet its targets and the targets which were which set. Lakshmi. Thanks, Geoffrey. We have a few questions actually on the regulatory uncertainties, uh, especially pertaining to the fact that within the one megawatt permit, which was introduced, the diesel generator backup is also included, which actually acts as a disincentive uh, because it also means longer project execution time as more projects need to acquire this permit 
uh, and also it means higher cost for the project. Um, so it would be it would have been great to hear more about how on one hand there are certain incentives in place already for the CNI PV sector, uh, which has provided a boost. Yes, Nixon. Okay. Sorry maybe I will. That. Maybe I'll ask you this question because there are one or two questions that are pointed at the regulatory uncertainties around the CNI PV. I'm sorry we couldn't uh, hear. Uh, your presentation, but maybe this could be one way to cover it. Perhaps you could talk about the one megawatt uh, uh, licensing permit and also the fact that it includes the diesel generator backup in it. Okay, so basically for projects that are above one megawatt, combined installed capacity, they require to get a generation license from the authority. But for cases where they, they are for own consumption without any transaction in terms of sale of electricity, then they are able to, to install without necessarily getting a special lecture from the authority. Okay. And do you have something to say about how can we bring more transparency? I mean, and probably a question that uh, Geoffrey had raised, you know, what what is the requirement for a PPA for a CNI? Uh, market segment. What does a PPA look like? Uh, are we? Uh, how can there be more transparency and less variation in the contractual conditions that are being uh, agreed upon? Okay. Uh, uh, we have been engaging internally to see how to facilitate such a transaction. Uh, out of the uh, the Energy Act, we are required to approve transactions for sale. And use and retail of electricity. However, for projects where there is an agreement between the utility, the, the person, the project developer, and the end user, we are considering exempting that requirement, uh, but so requiring them to comply with the other requirements such as a NEMA approval by the local authority, but not necessarily approving the tariff because after our engagement, then we see. There's little we could do in terms of the PPA, uh, uh, but we will also require them to have approval for payment, to be able to pay the taxes where they're required to, so that they don't have challenges with the Senate Revenue Authority and also levy, some of the levies. Thank you, Nixon. And I guess with this, we I will hand over the floor back to Louisa. Thank you so much for all the great questions and detailed answers. Um, we have actually now come to the end of the webinar and I would really like to thank all of the speakers for the informative and interesting presentations and to you, the audience, for your active participation. I hope that the presentation has been useful and beneficial for all of you. You can find more information about the Penon project and download our Clean Capture Power Report on our website. The webinar material will also be available on University Partnerships website in the next couple of days. And also, please feel free to contact us if you have any questions. And please follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter to learn more about our future work and upcoming webinars. So um, thank you for your attention. And we hope to see you again in our future webinars. Thank you.